there, there, there was a certain folly in my um, agreeing to come and, and talk with you. you know, something that had something to do with your work or was sort of foundational, which is... Uh, and I sort of felt like that's what the truth does. So there's a sense of this is just an intimation of what is about to come in the book. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to the flawless nature of this writing. This is what really blew me away. What is important, it seems to me, is not so much to defend the culture. This was a deliberate book and she struggled with every sentence. One of the things that I've been writing about is the experience of reading something and saying to yourself, I, I didn't know you could do this. I didn't know you could do this. I didn't know you could write the most, you know, the, the pivotal line in a story and not tell the reader who said it. I didn't know, you know, until I read, well, again, Moby Dick, that you could have Father Mapple's sermon go on and on and on and on near the beginning of the narrative and the reader's gonna stay with it. Or, you know, I mean, there, I, you know, I can go on and on, there's so many. But it's always a big revelation and it's always, I don't know what, inspiriting, encouraging to find that in a book and you go, oh, I, I, I just didn't know you could do that. I thought, I thought you had to do something else, but as it turns out, you don't because Turgenev didn't. I knew about write what you know, the old adage, write about what you know. I thought it intuitively, that was freaking me out. I couldn't write about what I know because I didn't think what I know amounted to anything. But when I was a, a, a young writing teacher, I was teaching um, in upstate New York at uh, Binghamton and I had undergraduate um, students. And all their writing was very mannered, they, you know, they were, they were writing hardcore stuff about Vietnam vets, and these are kids from Mineola, you know, suburban Long Island. Or, you know, they're, they're, they're writing about down, dirty African-American drug addicts when, when their last name was Schwartz, you know, and they lived in, you know, five towns. And I finally said, listen, man, this is, this is bullshit. I mean, just, what do you know? Who are you? What does your father do? I just, just write about, as I said, the whole thing, write about what you know. And it did. And the writing became better simply because it was more centered. They were more centered. Didn't necessarily mean make them great writers or anything. But here's the punchline. So everybody's going around, do -do 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 -do. you got to write what you know, do -do -do -do. write what you know, because <laughs> Professor Price will like you. you know. So they did that, they did that. I leave Binghamton. And the, the writing professor they hired after me was John Gardner, who I don't know if anybody knows who John Gardner was. But he was, he was a, a, a very gifted, more fantastical writer, very much more experimental and not, um, you know, pinned to the ground uh, in his imagination. And so a lot of my students, went into his class and they, they, you know, and they'd write stories about working at a service station, you know, in Queens or, you know, working for an undertaker, you know, um, you know, in Summit, New Jersey. And he'd look at this and he said, this is crap. What are you giving me this stuff? This is so pedestrian and boring. And one girl said, but Professor Price said we should write about what we know. He says, who gives a shit what you know? You're 18. You don't know anything. Make stuff up. Use your imagination. So, you know, that's why they have horse races. <laughs> I never say right about what you know anymore. I understand that this is like we're here to talk as writers, right? And the things we identify with as writers. So this book and this writer, in particular Naipaul, were important to me uh, like from the start of my career as a writer. The, you know, it's just the pure writing. I could start almost anywhere. Let me just quickly, a little collage of just little moments. He stretched out in one short trousered leg and held his hands around this upright knee. I love that sentence because it's so simple. You know, and sometimes when we write, I, at least I, you know, you, you have in your mind the picture of somebody in a posture and that posture seems to communicate so much. And when you actually try and write it, you know, and you picture it in your mind like, like, like one of the great, you know, masters of painting will do just these fantastic, simple line drawings. You know, just try sometimes. A sentence like that can be so hard to write, to get that simple line. 
No, I find, right? The way, and, 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 and he's just a master, both in the, in the facial expressions and the postures. Um, uh, it's uh, contemporary writers. I don't. I can't think of anyone else who does it. I, I mean, they're not contemporary anymore, really. I was going to say Bello, especially saw Bello with faces, right? What Bello can do with a face, I think Naipaul can do with just the whole human body, right? And you are going to be a great man, Ramchan said. A great man, reading like that at your age. Used to hear you reading those things to Akhoda, etc. That's a theme that's going to reverberate throughout the book. Right, as it reverberated throughout Naipaul's own life and his own relationship to his own father. Right, this pressure to be great. Mr. Biswas's self-imposed, almost in some ways ludicrous, right, it, 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 it so deeply felt aspiration and conviction that greatness was within his reach, which then, which of course it's not in the ways he meant it, though I think the son would say it was there in other ways. And the way he passes that on to his son as both it's a very complicated gift and burning burden, which is really at the bottom of this book, right? And this is like the first time that theme is sort of introduced, you know. Uh, not finished with these decorations, he said, pointing to the walls. Get him some more of those Sunday school pictures. Jesus and Mary, eh, Dahuti? Laughing. I mean, it's just the, you know, that, 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 you know, pure village peasant, you know, uh, crudeness of it all, right? Laughingly, he flung the matchstick he had been chewing at the baby. I got another name. I got a name for another one of your brother-in-laws. He told Shama that evening, lying on his blanket, his right foot and his left knee, peeling off a broken nail from his big toe. I just, I just love all the grossness. Yeah, the gross. Everybody, it's, it's the tropics. It's poor people. Everybody's just got rotted toes. You know, that's the way it is. It's, um... From his big toe. So, so I married a liar um, who, who has always the best intentions and indeed likes, um, likes people to be happy, rather like Zeno. Um, and, and there just came a point where I said, you know, you've you got to leave me out of it. Um, but, but early on, I mean, there are many, many stories um, of, his, of his lies. Like when I, we met in England and I was studying at Cambridge, and he was too, and then he was in London. And, I, I, I missed the train to get back for tutorial and he called up and said that I missed the train because my mother was visiting London and had been running for a bus and had broken her collarbone, which wasn't true. Um, but the, the, the professor was, of course, then very sympathetic. And um, when I went, I talked a lot about what had happened when he'd broken his own collarbone. So. But, but on the um, telling, telling a story just to, um, ju just just to make somebody happy, it, it wasn't about war, so it wasn't going to um, cause. But but he didn't he didn't when we were younger. If we were invited to dinner parties on the same night, he didn't he didn't like to disappoint somebody, so he would just say yes, even if he knew three weeks or a month before that you know we weren't going to be able to go. And then sometimes he would remember to get out of it, and then other times he wouldn't. And there was a time when we were supposed to go to a dinner party, and um, I suddenly realized we were also supposed to go to another dinner party at the same time. And so I said, you know, you, you've, got to, you've got to do something about that. So he called up this chap and he said, well, I'm afraid we can't come because Claire has appendicitis. And, um, and, we're, uh, and, we're, and we're rushing. But it get, it gets, it, this, this is one of the things afterwards. I said, you can't include me in the lies anymore. He said, she has appendicitis and we have to rush to the hospital. And, um, and, and, and then we went to the other dinner party and promptly forgot, you know, as one does. And so, and, and so three months later, we, we run into Francis, the guy who had the dinner party, and he looks and he says, gosh, Claire, I hope you're okay. And I don't, of course, wasn't my lie. I don't remember. I don't know what he's talking about. And my husband did not miss a moment, did not miss a beat, stepped right in. He said, do you know what? He said, we got to the hospital, and it turned out it was just trapped wind. <laughs> so anyway... Um, so maybe you could say I'm married. I'm married. I'm married to Zeno Cassini, but um, but 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 the, the sort of human um, truth of, of of you 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 come up with the thing that will solve the problem in the moment, never anticipating that it will generate another problem that will then need to be solved. And I was thinking about how I learned to read, and and then. How I learned to read and how I learned to read critically, which is what I do most of the time, and how that related to this book. And, um, and it related also to my experience in Naples, where I had 
been once in 1967. So I, it was as if I had never been to Venice. And when you're, especially when you're young, but not necessarily only, when you're in a new place, your senses recover their original design, if you believe in design, or their original function, which is to gather intelligence. And the gathering of intelligence is also the gathering of pleasure. So at a certain level, a certain very, very sort of prim primitive level, the gathering of the intelligence that's necessary for survival and the pleasure that you get from the senses and sounds and, 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 and sensory experience of the environment in which you're gathering that together create a very powerful impression. And if you're a professional reader, the way I am, you sometimes forget that. You think, oh, well, I better read this. Oh, it's not. And if you can relax into reading, the way you relax into a sort of Walter Benjamin-like, Flaner-like uh, exploration of a place, uh, I, 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 I was reminded of that rereading this book. Um, you're attuned to what's going on under the surface. You're paying attention in a way that you don't when you're just cerebrally engaged. So um, you can't always do that. Um, Andre and I were talking about you can't do that with every writer. Some writers are very cerebrally demanding. You can, it's hard to read Kierkegaard that way. Um, but, but Ferrante invites that, just as her Naples invites that. Um, now, part of that is dreamlike. You can, you, sometimes it happens to me, I find, I, want, I wind up after a long, long, long thing with a kind of story-like coherence that I didn't intend, that, I, I'm, that surprises me, that, that sort of strange, uh, incoherent coherence. And sometimes you'll write something and, and you'll reread it, maybe even years later, and you'll see this sort of strange inner coherence that is dreamlike that you didn't, uh, you didn't plant. You didn't plant it. It's there, mysteriously. I think without this novel, a lot of 20th century literature wouldn't have been written. From what I can gather, nearly everybody read Kafka. Kafka definitely read it. <clears throat> Isaac Nassim Shigirka, everything came out of this. Uh, Henry Miller, that he couldn't have been a writer without a um, novel like Sartre's Nausea, I don't think it was <coughs> written without this. Um, some of Céline, Beckett. Um, it's all part of this thing that maybe starts in Dostoevsky, but is reiterated and recast, I think, in this book. And the pity is, all these translations are lost. So we don't really get a sense of what the Norwegian was like. Uh, my wife, Norwegian mother. And she, she's perfectly fluent in Norwegian. She tells me that it's electrifying. And when as this was published, it changed Norwegian literature overnight. It was a kind of combination of poetry and uh, uh, you know the language of the streets and the high and low coming together in new ways that had never happened in uh, Scandinavia before. But we can't we can't really there's something in this novel that just goes outside of psychology, outside of ordinary, you know, romantic love. I mean, I think I was on the internet and I saw this incredibly stupid drawing of, you know, Heathcliff and, you know, Catherine and this kind of thing, you know, and it's like, you know, fan mail and everything. And, you know, it's like, it's like, how can you do this to my book? You know, it's, it's, it's the, it's, it's not that kind of romantic love. You're right. It's really outside that. And there is necrophilia. You know, there is the moment of necrophilia, which is, we're pretty big. I mean, he digs up the coffin and, you know, he's in there or almost in there. And, and, and she's not, she's not whole. I mean, you know, I mean, and, and at one point Nellie says a beautiful thing, and who is his deity? Ashes, what is it? Just, you know, it's like uh, a senseless ashes. I mean, 
it's a pretty, you know, but we can't believe Nellie either. She's a very sensible, moral, good-hearted woman, but that is not, that is not the place to put your faith. I read one critic on something, you know, Nellie like the Christian reading of the book is like, no, no, you can't, that, that's a real failure, I think, as a reader to go with something, or the failure that may be, you know, the, the young lover's failure, which is to see this as some romantic love affair that's not about something really, and then when, you know, Lockwood uh, takes over Nellie's voice. Really weird. You know, you've got something strange going on about the idea of the narrator itself. I don't. I mean, I don't have you know some some uh, brilliant explanation, but one could certainly think about that for a long time and keep digging into the book to find out what this is about. It seems to me that there's kind of some decisions that are made really early in the book that allow him to sort of stop making those sort of very writerly choices toward the middle and, and the book kind of achieves a different tone. What I mean by that is like, you know, like most of the time when you read a book that has realist elements, whatever, you know, and some magical or folkloric elements, it seems, at least to my mind, with the exception of maybe two or three writers I can think of, you know, probably the greatest being, besides Platonic, being like Marquez, right? That, um, that the material exists on two different planes, you know? Um, I mean, I always at least kind of feel that that transition between something that is real and something that slowly enters into a dreamscape or whatever word you want, um, you can see the writer sort of straining for an effect on both sides. But from the beginning, by insisting on this, by, by being resigned to this diction, by having this idea that maybe we're seeing it through the eyes of um, through the protagonist, he's already kind of telling you that you're going to have to um, constantly float in this middle ground between attributing the observations um, to the authorial third person, to authorial omniscience, and to and to the protagonist. And I don't really know of that many books, frankly, that string you along in that middle ground for so long. I know a lot of books that do that free and direct thing of like, hey, look at me. I'm the author. I'm the third person on mission guy. Remember me? And then you're like in a character's head. You know, a character says something, then you're in their head for a little bit. Then you're in another character's head. I mean, I'm paragraphing here. I'm pressing return after each one, right? Then you're like, you're in another character's head. Then you're like in the other character's head. And then you're back into that paragraph of like third person omniscience, right? And you seem to always be toggling among these, among these consciousnesses. Whereas this really sustains this strange, I don't know, this, this kind of film over whatever's going on that allows the transition between types of material in a pretty elegant way. The symbol problem is, is even harder. Because why, like, why symbols, you know? Like, so we all can get good grades? It's like, seriously, it's just like, you know, like anyone who's gonna go out of their way to spend fucking $25 on a hardcover book and then spend hours of their day when they're much more entertaining and naked people around to watch and to think about, right? Anyone who's going to spend their time like actually like looking about something, camera, so like, are they really gonna be so happy when you're like, oh, look, a symbol. Oh, look, I noticed it, it's a symbol. You know, that's a penis, that's a vagina, that's money, that's this. You know, like, you know, like, what, what, like, is it so Pavlovian that you get your little pellet of happiness when you recognize a symbol and you get petted? And it, like, is that it? it really, I mean, is, you know, is that all there is, right? And that's the problem. And I think that previously when people weren't as not only, you know, li like literate semiotically, but beyond that, when people maybe weren't as, you know, um, publicly in touch with certain um, emotions or drives, the idea of symbols would be a way to smuggle meaning into a work that it couldn't otherwise be there. You know, it's a way to kind of smuggle something in that would either be 
too prurient or in some way heretical or in some way prejudicial to the rest of the text. But now when there's nothing prurient, there's nothing heretical, who the fuck cares? The symbol, to me, is what does it mean? What I, what I will say is to find a way to inoculate a reader against symbols early. Um, by doing something along the lines of what this does, which is telling a story, which is essentially a structural metaphor containing the book, you know, in, in miniature, a synecdoche of the book, let's say. And what I mean by that is like a gesture, some hand to a reader that says, you know, listen, you know, I'm not an idiot. I know you're not an idiot. We like, I spent a lot of time doing this. You're going to spend a lot of time looking at it. You know, um, we both know that things can be hidden somewhere that you can find and then feel good about yourself finding. But let's find a way to get rid of that notion of gratification, which I believe is kind of an academic approach to, to reading, if not honestly a behaviorist approach, right? And say, um, once we clear that out and we acknowledge that we're living in the symbolic universe, maybe we can layer some things on top of this that bring us to some um, strange places and uncomfortable places. And we can sort of figure out where that goes. In a world of symbols, a tumbleweed is just a tumbleweed. Following a tumble, like in a world that is a symbol, a desert that is a symbol, sometimes just, you know, a camel is a camel, you know? And, and, and so it actually makes for, in my mind, some pretty interesting ambiguities once he kind of lays out this entire, um, this entire structural metaphor of this, you know, dualistic fight of the desert of darkness and this distant land of light and these people, this, this horrible demon who was kicked out, who might not have been horrible, might just be the saddest and poorest person, right? And then the next page being like, oh, or in the page after that, you know, the John, they're made up of a lot of criminals, a lot of women who run away from their husbands, a lot of dudes who deserted the army, you know, like, you know, not the bad guys, not the dark guys, but, you know, the sad guys, you know, like, just, and then just doing that and saying, right, like, here's my math. I showed you my work, but let's see, like, where it goes. That, I don't know. That, that to me, is, is so much more interesting than, than all the mullions of the windows that look like crosses. Pinchon always disdains the, the uh, debt that he has to the beats. And I think he has a huge debt to the beats. Mm -hmm. And that the beat, that part of the beat legacy in the work is... You know, it's about the, the ride, and it's not about the destination, and it's about temporary effects as opposed to systematized effects. You know, he can talk a good game with the math part of the whole thing. He knows the math. He worked at Boeing. He's a math genius. But when it comes down to it, you know, Richard Brodigan and Jack Kerouac are more important models for Pinchon than. I just want to talk about tragedy and so one of the things about tragedy is this notion of the fatal flaw and the question of catharsis, does the hero find any self-knowledge, we, we usually ask for that. Um, and Lily has a fatal flaw, she creates her own fate, she, I believe she does find redemption, she does understand herself at the end. But one of the things I want you to remember about this book is she is one of the few women up until now who creates her own fate. And we have seen tragic heroines. We have seen Emma Bovary. We have seen Anna Karenina. Their, shapes were fated, their fates were shaped by men. Lily creates her own fate. She stands alone against the sky. She is like Lear. This entire book depends on her actions alone. So what Horton has done is create a great hero who is a female. And she's one of the first to do that. And I want to look at two passages 
One is on page one, 102, actually. The leafless trees on the slopes of the park were ready, already deep in the shadows rising from the earth, semicolon. Before us, at the foot of the hill, was the broad square of turf, black as night and crossed diagonally by two pale sandy paths and the white facades and colonnades of the National Maritime Museum. And on the Isle of Dogs, on the far side of the river, the sparkling glass towers rose above the rapidly gathering darkness in the last of the daylight. Now let me go to page 112. Now, you see it at the line 10 or something? There was something fleeting, evanescent about those sparse patterns appearing in constant succession on the pale surface, something which never went beyond the moments of its generation, so to speak. Yet here in the interwining of sunlight and shadow, always forming and reforming, you could see mountainous landscapes and glaciers and ice fields, high plateau steps, deserts, fields are full of flowers, islands in the sea, coral reefs, archipelagos and stall and atolls. I don't know what an atoll is, I don't know. Forests bending to the form, quaking grass and drifting smoke. And once I remember, said Austerlitz, as we gazed together at the slowly fading world, Adela leaned towards me and asked, do you see the fronds of the palm trees? Do you see the caravan coming through the dunes over there? Okay. Notice, I mean, this is amazing prose. You would be, um, you would not be allowed to write such prose today. No magazine will publish this prose, unless, of course, it wants to make a point. And it's, it, what? That's John, what do you think? <laughs> you give it a shot. You would. Okay, great. Okay, there's a future then. Okay. Uh, no, but the point is that this is this is amazing prose. I mean, it's it's Miltonian. Now, if I were teaching a class on Proust and I had a sentence like this, this is the most unProustian sentence ever written. It's long. James could never be capable of writing such a sentence because he's not a good craftsman. That's my view. Okay. Um, but neither would Virginia Woolf. She wouldn't be able to do this. This is this is sustained. And of course, what carries it is the fact that he names all those peculiar places and forests and steps, etc., etc. But do you think he needed to say all these things? He wants to create a rhythm, and he wants, he wants the rhythm. The rhythm exists in everything. And notice how he blends the rhythm with the said Austerlitz. And Adela said it, okay? In other words, he, he, everything is everything is underwritten by this rhythm which for me and I, I you may disagree with me and please disagree for me it's 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 not just a rhythm and a cadence that is specific to him but it's a rhythm and that has meaning and I think the meaning that it has if I can give it a sort of a easy label it tries to imitate the flow of water if I may the flow of time. This is, uh, this is a particular kind of cadence which is not just meditative, which it is, but at the same time what it tries to do is try, it's almost like beating to a very specific um, rhythm and the rhythm is the one of time. And, and, and for me it's as if the rhythm, the time factor, which is a very, um, very pertinent subject of this book, not only habits it as a, as a topic of the book, but it is there in its very matrix, in its very um, skeleton. Time inhabits everything, even the way people speak. Now, you will notice that an editor today will say, people don't speak like this. When he reports what somebody has said at length, he's not reporting it as, an, uh, 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 uh. In other words, he's not interested in reporting exactly how it might have been spoken. He's more interested in, in sort of suffusing whatever is being spoken into the text so that everything is under, as I said, underscored by the same exact tempo. And the tenor is identical. And one of the things that's beautiful about the story, I think, is that, um, what do I want to say? I mean, there's no obvious epiphany in the kind of, you know, creepy... I mean, once I got into this huge argument with this guy that was auditing 
he was editing a book about, I don't know, how to write short stories or something. And, um, and he wanted me to write some essay, and I did. And he said, well, you left out the most important thing. And I said, what? And he said, well, you left out the fact that there has to be an epiphany in a story. And I said, actually, I don't really think there has to be an epiphany in a story. And it went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Well, there doesn't. There doesn't. But you know, one of the things I think, the mistakes that, that, um, that, that young readers are often, uh, that are often instilled in young readers by their otherwise well-meaning you know, eighth grade teachers, is that there has to be, somebody has to learn something. Nobody has to learn anything. You don't have to learn anything. There's not, that is not a requirement for fiction. Because why should it be a requirement for fiction when it's not you know, for life? Exactly. You can go through your entire life and just not figure it out. It happens. It happens. So, so we're going to just you know, twist it around for the purposes of fiction where everybody is older and wiser by the end of the story than they were at the beginning? No. I mean, it can happen. It's not like that doesn't happen. But it doesn't have to happen. It's not a necessity. And I don't think, you know, the narrator, by the time he's, by the time he's writing the story, he's kind of figured out what happened. But not, by, not when he's 16, not, still not when he's 16 and watching his father, isn't it? If we look for a minute at that section about his father's death, it's funny to me because when I first read it, um, I, I, I had never seen anybody die um, or, or dying. And I think when I, and when I read it again, I had never seen anybody die. And when I read it this time, I have, I have watched my parents die. Um, and, and I think um, the human truth of, of the description is incredibly, uh, it's both funny and ghastly and incredibly true. So on, on my version, page 55, one evening, Carlo, the orderly, summoned me to observe some new progress in my father. I rushed after him, my heart pounding at the idea that the old man might become conscious of his illness and reproach me for it. It comes up again with Giovanni, where I think it's Coppler says, the man is di a man is dying and doesn't know it, right? And, 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 and in terms of Zeno, part of his so-called strength is, 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 is his, precisely his neurosis, his self-awareness that he doesn't, nothing will come upon him unawares. And, and, and so in that sense, he's in a stronger, even if he's sick, he's in a stronger position because, because it won't, you know, it's, it's like the, I used to always stay awake on the airplane, you know, always stay awake and just in case. And then, and then my husband said, so you want to be the first to know we're going down? Like, what, is, that, is, that, is there some advantage to that? You know, but, but, but it is, a, it is a, a, a version, I mean, you can see that as a type of strength. But my father was on his feet in the middle of the room dressed only in his underwear. Uh, da, da, da. He, when I came in, he said to Carlo, open. He wanted the window open. Carlo replied that he couldn't do it because of the great cold, and for a while my father forgot his own demand. He went and sat down in an armchair by the window and stretched out seeking relief. When he saw me, he smiled and asked, did you sleep? I don't believe my reply reached him. This wasn't the consciousness I had feared so long. When a man dies, he has too many other worries to allow any thinking about death, which of course reads as a very comic line, but is also true. My father's whole organism was concentrated on respiration, and instead of listening to me, he shouted again at Carlo, open. He could find no rest. He left the chair in order to stand up, and so on and so on. That day, moving from bed to chair, he stopped at the mirror and gazing at himself in it, murmured, I look like a Mexican. I think it was, I think it was to escape the ghastly monotony of the race from bed to chair that on this day he attempted to smoke. For, for me, reading this this time, uh, I, I remembered a time, and it was actually my father's penultimate illness, but he was delirious in hospital. And he suddenly sat up, and he, he, I guess he was being transferred from one room to another, and we were in a hallway, and he was on a gurney, and he was absolutely not compass mentis. And he looked up, and he said to my sister and me, who were standing beside him, he said, I know what this is. This is a fiesta. With a, <laughs> he did this little gesture, like, this is a fiesta. And, and, it, and it was, you know, it was, it was a little bit like sort of Captain Haddock in, um, when drunk, you know. Uh, but, but, but it was also this, um, this realization that whatever he was experiencing, it was absolutely real and totally intense. It was like a dream indeed. He was in it. I mean, we were there with him. But, but we couldn't cross into 
the world that, that he was in. And that indeed, at that time, he then made a, my dad made a miraculous recovery at that point, more information than you need to know, but it was nice that he did. Um, but, but he did not, for a second, think of death. It did, it did not, I mean, in that, in that sense, we should all be reassured, really, that, that, that we will be like, um, like Zeno's father and, and like Giovanni that in the moment. Uh, she resists every sentimental turn possible in this book. And she makes fun of it. I mean, she, she, they read a lot of novels. So they must have digested huge numbers of these sentimental novels. You know, what, what um, uh, George Eliot called, you know, silly novels by silly lady novelists. You know, with the perfect heroines. It's a, it's a, a kind of a, an essay that she wrote. And, and she makes a lot of fun out of these, you know, perfect um, sentimental heroines of that period. And I think, uh, you know, the older I get, um, the more I, um, I guess, the more I appreciate the extreme violation of cliches that Bronte is up to. Really, she really hates him. More than her sister. Jane Eyre, Jane Eyre is a softer book with Bertha and everything. I mean, it's a wonderful book, but, but it's a softer book. And that's why it got better reviews. But of course, he is mistreated as the dark gypsy outsider, and he is humiliated. And this is an engine for vengeance, if there ever was one, right? I mean, so there are uh, motivations inside the text itself. And then we don't know what happened. In fact, every time Heathcliff is out he is literally a figure that's outside the story until he arrives. He's like, uh, you know, a satellite orbiting this world, and then he enters it. Right? He comes back. He returns from wherever. Rich. Yeah. Right? It's like yeah. a fairy tale. And then there's all the stories. You know, this is also, I mean, as I say, I think this is a book about the imagination. It's about storytelling as well. He was maybe a soldier. You know, there's speculation, how did he make the money? You know, and then there even, I think some critics speculate, you know, the slave trade, something really awful, you know? Or, uh, you know, what, how, where did the money come from? But it's outside the story. And that mystery is, of course, it, it becomes part of it. Gossip becomes part of the gossip, the invention of stories that's part of the book. And you know, Lockwood at one point, remember Lockwood says that he has this sort of fleeting fantasy of, of marrying uh, Catherine too, or he, she's beautiful, so he has an attraction to her. And Nellie clearly also had this idea. So this is like a little storybook ending. It's like Emily Bronte saying, ha ha. That's you thought maybe Lockwood was going to take Catherine and run off to London with her. But no, it stays inside the Wuthering Heights Grange story, and, and, and they link up in that way. They're insiders. Now, you all know um, that when you write in the first person, there's certain limitations that are automatically imposed on, on the narrative. You can't get into the head of the other characters. Absolutely. And beyond that? You can't know anything really that your narrator doesn't know, or that your narrator hasn't witnessed, or that your narrator isn't privy to in some way, right? But here, you really know quite a lot that the narrator doesn't, doesn't know and isn't privy to, again, without it feeling like a trick. Um, because the thing is, the way around the problem of the first person is, you give the other characters, the other characters, okay, first person narrator, it's limited, um, limited point of view. You can only know a certain number of, th other things, number of things. Um, but the other characters are going to reveal themselves or be revealed or established in some way, obviously. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother having other characters. I mean, they have 
a life, right? They have a life. And the only way to give them that life in a limited first person narrative is by making them talk, is by making them act, is by giving them, you know, a certain amount of, um, you know, actualization, whatever you call it. Because, because that's the only way that they can exist. Is there, okay, so in theory, you have this, you know, story in which we have a first person narrator, close th first person narrator, who only, who has a very limited um, view of the characters. And, um, or, yeah, a limited view of the characters. Now, in another kind of story, you go, the, you know, you progress into the story and you get to know more and more and more about the characters. And they become, you know, just because of, again, even in a first person narrative, because of their own actions, because of their own, um, uh, what they say, what they do, blah, blah, blah. They reveal themselves. We feel that we know who they are. What about the what about the other characters in this story? I mean, it's one of the reasons. Again, another one of the reasons why it's such a, an unusual book. I mean, do you feel that you have a deep understanding of the soldier, the poet, the doctor? Let's say Zaneda, the father, the mother. You don't, right? Now, isn't it kind of amazing that here's a book in which the characters, all the constellation of secondary characters who are extremely important, including Zanita, kind of remain as opaque to us by the end as they are at the beginning? I mean, in theory, what you're supposed to do, you know, supposed to do, is, uh, is write a narrative in which characters are more and more and more transparent, right? They talk, they act, you see them, they do things, they interact, you know, blah, blah. These characters, they're not. They're not there, you know, and also to populate her little court with the doctor, the poet, the soldier, the this, that, you know, I mean, believe me, in three weeks, if you think back on the story, that's kind of what you're going to remember about them. They're not particularly, you know, what we call individualized characters. I mean, the doctor has, you know, and the poet have more going for them in. And certainly, you know, the author of the anonymous letter, blah, blah. But they're not particularly individualized. So, so to make a decision not to go deeper into the characters, to keep the characters on the same level of opacity that they are at the beginning. And yet, you know, here we have narrator. Here we have father, Zaneda, all these other people. And by the time we get to the end of the story, we're profoundly, I think, moved by it. I just find this scene, this is the scene when he runs into her husband, just so full of like all the things Naipaul can convey, all the complex, unexpected little emotionally or sometimes you know, so devastatingly insightful uh, things that he could portray just through, through, the, through the art of incredibly observant uh, and secretly busy Underneath the surface, busy, you know, realist writing. You no, know, it's uh, they come to the the house, right? That his sister absolutely is now living in. Uh, his sister, who supposedly is married, you know, even into a lower situation than the one, you know, and they than the one that where, that, that surrounds Mr. Biswas. The hut indicated lowness in no way. The mud walls had been freshly whitewashed and decorated with blue and green and red palm prints. Mr. Biswas recognized Ramchand's broad palm and stubby fingers. The thatch was new and neat. The earth floor was high, had been packed hard. Pictures from calendars were stuck on the walls, and in the veranda there was a hat rack. It was altogether less depressing than the crumbling, neglected hut in the back trace. But it seemed to the, that to Dehute, marriage had brought no joy. The first of like these incredibly complex, uh, 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 joyless seeming marriages that we get throughout the book, right? None more, more so than Mr. Biswas's the Shama. But it seemed that to, she was uneasy at being caught among her household possessions and tried to hint that they had nothing to do with her. When Ranchem started to point out some attractive feature of the hut, she sucked her teeth and desisted. Mr. Biswas couldn't believe that the Huti had ever spoken about him, as Ramshad had said. She hardly spoke hardly looked at him. 
Without expression, she brought out an ugly baby from an inner room asleep and showed it, suggesting at the same time that she had not brought it out to show it. She looked careworn and sulky, untouched by her husband's bubbling desire to please. Yet in her unharried way, she did what she could to make Mr. Biswas, Mr. Biswas welcome. He understood that she feared rebuff and the reports he might take back, and this made him uncomfortable. The Hoti never pretty was now frankly ugly. Her Chinese eyes looked sleepy, the pupils without a light, the whites smudged. Her cheeks, red with pimples, bulged low and drooped around her mouth. Her lower lip projected as though squashed out by the weight of her cheeks. She sat on a low bench, the back of her long skirt caught tightly between her calves and the back of her thighs, the front draped over her knees. Mr. Biswas was surprised by her adulthood. It was the way she sat, knees apart, yet so decorously covered. He had associated that only with mature women. He tried to find in the woman the girl he had known, but seeing her growing needlessly impatient while Ramchand, at her instructions, lit the fire and prepared to boil the rice, Mr. Biswas felt that this sight of the Houthi had wiped out the old picture. This was a loss. It added to the unhappiness he had begun to feel as soon as he entered the hut. Branchan came out from the kitchen and sank in the most relaxed way onto the earth floor. He stretched out in one short trousered leg and held his hands around this upright knee. I love that sentence because it's so simple. You know, and sometimes when we write, I, at least I, you know, you, you have in your mind the picture of somebody in a posture, and that posture seems to communicate so much. And when you actually try and write it, you know, and you picture it in your mind, like, like, like one of the great, you know, masters of painting will do just these fantastic, simple line drawings. You know, just try sometimes. A sentence like that can be so hard to write, to get that simple line. And the funny thing about Thompson himself, this is probably not relevant, he was very arrogant, and uh, I think after hunger came out, it was a big sensation. He gave some lectures, and one, when Ibsen was there, Ibsen had been living in, in Italy for 27 years. He had just returned, and he was in his mid-60s, and Hobson was in his early 30s, and he's giving a lecture, and Ibsen is in the front row, and he just starts attacking him. You know, you're an old fogey, and you don't know what the fuck you're doing, and it's terrible, and all these bourgeois things are finished, you're finished, and I'm the future. I mean, this is the way Thompson talks. He was uh, insufferable. So I don't know if it's pure failure in the novel so much as um, it's locked in some drama that, uh, well, shame, pride, I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, but there's some, it's, it's, it's self-destructive. I had a homicide detective when I was writing Clockers. Um, I was going around with the crime scene unit, um, which responds to all homicides in New York City. And it went during the height of the crack epidemic. So they were running back and forth. They had 20, something like 2,200 homicides that year. And um, there was a shooting in the Bronx. Apparently, what happened was, a guy was on a payphone outside of Bodega, and he was fighting with his girlfriend. And he was yelling at the girlfriend, and he hangs up the phone. Goes, bam, bam, he's hanging up the phone, you fucking fuck. And then he walks away, and he's walking up the street, still fighting with his girlfriend in his head, and it just in a, and he turns, pulls out a gun, and he turns, and he turns to shoot the phone, like his girlfriend's mouth is still on the phone. Unfortunately, there was another guy on the phone at the time, and he killed him. Now, we go to the scene, and there's a guy, and he's dead. Um, and nobody, nobody, I don't know, but that was the story, but there were no witnesses. So my first question to these homicide detectives, you don't know who this, you don't even have a witness, how are you going to find out who did it? And he said to me, two things. Um, a deer never travels more than a mile from the spot that it's born. And it always walks in the paths of its ancestors. These guys don't go anywhere. He's around. We'll find him. He doesn't have the imagination to get on a bus and go to Puerto Rico or South Carolina or Canada. 
he's here. He's not going anywhere. And that's like these characters, Vinny and Al and all these guys, they're not going anywhere. They live in the moment, perpetually in the moment. They're not going anywhere. They don't have the imagination to reflect or wonder or, or even imagine or dream. It's like, if you have no imagination, you might as well die today because you, you're, you, you're going to be in the same, sp it's, it is like a death, just your existence is death in a way. So it comes back to the end. At the age of 66, after 50 years, I said, wow, this is a good book. After going through periods of that, this book is overblown. You know, I just re so just, just think of it, I'll just do an experiment. Think about the book that blew your mind first as an adolescent. Not when you, you know, I'm not talking about wind in the willows. You know, as an adolescent, you know, be it like uh, Dickens or Salinger or John Steinbeck or whoever you read, read it again now. See, see what it does to you. The book doesn't change, you change. Um, when I was in my 30s, Someone that I knew who was also in her 30s um, died. She very, it was really shocking. She got a, a really bad cancer and it was diagnosed and within like eight months she was dead. And she was someone that a lot of us knew and um, she was kind of a, a gal about town. And um, so they had a memorial service for her and um, she, she was pretty accomplished and there were all these people who like traipsed up to give their eulogies and they all said, you know, she went to Yale, she spoke these languages, she did these things, she had these accomplishments, all of which were like really lovely and, and that you could read on her CV, honestly. They could have like published her CV. Her last girlfriend, what turned out to be her last girlfriend, got up and in her eulogy, she talked about some funny things that the woman who had died had said in the middle of the night. She was like a sleep talker. And the one who got up at the very end was, was by far, she wasn't like part of the class of these people. She was like, she was like an outsider for like a million, million reasons. And this is to your point, I was so moved by that because I thought, you know, the woman who died, the kind of CV worthy things she did, they're not gonna go away, right? Like in the sense that they're, they're written. But the person who remembers what you said, the dumb thing, the funny thing you said in the middle of the night, that dies with you unless someone says it. Anyone could say all this other stuff. Only the person who had been there could say that. And I thought, you win. You win the eulogy smackdown. <laughs> um, like, right? And I think that that is very much part of Wolf's, what you said is part of Wolf's aesthetic, that, that you know, um, there are great novels of the wars, right? Um, of various wars. But those histories are known, whereas many of the other things are, are not known and will be, and will be gone, okay? Um, and I think that that is absolutely part of, part of what she was doing. Someone was just saying to me the other day, that she wanted to do like a, like an encyclopedia of lost gestures, like the gesture of like picking up the receiver of the phone, mm -hmm. like when there was an actual receiver and like the little thing that you have to push down, right? That there's a whole bodily vocabulary that's, that's gone um, and that no one's gonna remember pretty soon, right? Or care um, and all of these, you know, all of these things will go away and that's that's an that's an aesthetics and an ethics what do we need to honor the things that are huge or the things that are going to 